Brewing is a science. You do lab tests, wear hard hats and goggles, keep spreadsheets and read graphs. You can get a BSE in it at university. But sometimes, a beer is more than the sum of its sums. It leaves everyone scratching their heads, and in that way, it's like art. So what happens when an artist becomes a brewer? Well, Arabeer. Before we get to what's my favourite beer in the world, let's talk about the brewery. De Dollar Brewers translates as the Mad Brewers, and in 1980 when they founded, they were just that. Belgium didn't really do bitterness back then, but Chris's beers had mountains of it on top of crazy depth of flavour from their mixed culture yeast. As you can tell, Chris himself is a huge but very understated character, and talking to him shows the dichotomy in him and his beers, which are the definition of organised chaos. De Dollar is where all kinds of unlikely things come together. Bitterness and Belgians, science and art, bar towels and waistcoats. So I'm here with Chris, uh, founder, uh, head brewer, and essentially De Dollar all rolled into one. Please tell me first the story of how De Dollar was founded. In 1980 we started officially after being home brewers for three years. We were getting interested into special beers, not lager, but uh, all special beers. Our icon was uh, Trappist beers. And right. So we make a beer which was uh, comparable to, uh, to Trappist beer, even not being the same. We didn't like uh, to copy, neither we don't know, but uh, we made uh, special, all special beers which were not comparable to others. So what did you do before you were a brewer? I was uh, studying a student, I was studying architecture. I'd been drawing all my life, so when I was very small, I was drawing cyclists and a football, football thing. Yeah. I uh, made uh, small paintings and small things of that. I still like uh, painting and I, do it, I, I try to combine painting and, and brewing at the same time. So the, the labels are your work? Yes. Yes. And you paint, you paint local people? I, uh, I have a collection, but the collection is now at the, the town hall. It's uh, all the members of the night and all the knights of the, the butter. But it's, it's the town of the butter. Uh, knights yeah. of the butter? Yeah, and they are all pictures like that with uh, the whole. But in uh, 1980 we took over the old brewery here, which was uh, stopped. And we said, uh, now we have a good, a good beer, but we can make it a, a little bit more than the 20 liters we made. Uh, the <laughs> and the more 20 liters, yeah. <laughs> so uh, one batch here is 3,000 liters, and the annual uh, uh, production here is uh, 1,500 hectares. liters. So what, what was here before? When, because this equipment is by no means new. Where, what's the history of it? It's been uh, the old brewery in the old region has been devastated by the First World War in 1914 between 14 and 18. Here, bombed and uh, destroyed in 1917. But uh, shortly after the First World War, been uh, rebuilt with the old bricks and the, and the equipment of that time, and it's still here. And so you, where most breweries would brew their beer in a mash tun, boil it, and then. Quick, cool it very quickly. You're using a cool ship. Yeah, the cool ship is uh, in copper, and copper gives uh, particles in the beer which are uh, essential for the taste. It's copper. The uh, copper beer is, is more rounded. It's more uh, has has more flavor than uh, stainless steel. Stainless steel is short. It's it's, it's clean. It's uh, it's. Yeah, uh, here so stainless steel, you add nothing. Copper, you add something. Yeah, and uh, what what does it add to the beer? It's a roundness, uh, a scenting, a flavour, you can hardly describe, but it's a... a minerality, kind of. Uh, minerality is more, is, is more for, from the water, but it, it's, it's uh, melting all the, the different tastes together with, with copper. Right. And copper, it's, a, it's antibacterial as well, so why all the breweries, the breweries were in copper in the time? Because uh, they didn't have uh, other materials and other metals. Uh, which were non corrosive. Cooling yourself in a cool ship, does that add any extra bacteria? Not, not really, because uh, we have the, the boiling wort, and the boiling wort it has uh, the temperature far uh, over the, uh, the temperature which uh, infection can, yeah. can take place. So we, we wait for one hour, and after that one hour, we let it run out to the bottle of cooler. And the bottle of cooler uh, cools it. Very quickly, from 
and 90, 95 degrees centigrade till 25 and it goes directly in fermentation. We add the yeast and the yeast is uh, converting all the sugars we have here in, the, in beer during one week and the, fer uh, the fermenters are open fermenters and strange but true, they are in copper as well. Great. And what, what, what's the benefit of an open fermenter, or is there none? Is it traditional? It's very traditional. It has. Um, it should have been uh, advantages because in, in England you had a, a working union system, and there was fermenting and then putting the yeast into uh, aeration as well. And aeration means. Uh, does not mean contamination by itself. It, it means uh, getting in contact with maybe other other bacteria or uh, other uh, things and, and yeast. Uh, a clear, a clean yeast is always is pure. That's that's the way lager is brewed. It's one strain of yeast multiplied and multiplied again, and then after what's happening is that after seven or ten times they use the they use that, that strain again. It's it's diminishing and it's it's you have to replace it with a uh, strains with high fermentation then you have different strains which uh, allow to, to help each other and to uh, deliver it with each other and it's very complex. Nobody can explain what it happens. And uh, the, the more strains you have in, in your yeast the more complexity you have in the taste and so you kind of let nature do its thing, where a lot of brewers are trying to control it. Your with your fermentation, it's not necessarily trying to affect. It's just going. What yeah, happens is making this beer, so I'll leave it. That's the mystery of uh, of uh, artisanal brewing, and that you you are always wondering how it will work, and you you try to help it in in the way you think uh, that it should be done. Mm. So you're kind of looking after the beer more than brewing it at some point. That's it. Yeah. I've said it on, on the channel that possibly my favourite beer in the world is Arabia, so it's quite humbling to be here. And that beer, it's a Belgian strong essentially, but it's not like it's not like a clean duvel. It's is it is it, is it Brett in there and there's different things that are maybe maybe uh, it's very simple. It's my favourite beer as well. It's uh, it uh, has the combination of bitterness, aggressive bitterness. The first uh, sip. That the ladies here at the bar, they, they have Arab beer. I said, well, you'd better not take that because it's too bitter. Yeah. Uh, but but I, say, I say, no, no, no. I say, but the, the first sip is, is the worst because the, the second one will be your your tongue and, and now the bitterness here yeah. will be a little bit uh, used to the bitterness. And then the second thing is say, it's not so bad. And the third is, is, is even better. And then the, uh, it's a slow and, down and, from that. <laughs> and I say that for the, after the three glasses, you're addicted to Arabia. <laughs> I, I certainly am. It would be wrong to assume Chris leaves much up to chance in brewing. He brews by instinct and experimentation, much like how he paints. But 37 years brewing plus three more spent home brewing means he also does it using experience. Like Lambic brewers, he gently guides nature to do his bidding, like a sculptor with wet clay. He proves that even if brewing isn't an art, there is an art to it.